G'day ladies and gents and welcome back to another edition of Supercoach Edge and uh, of course it is another edition yet again of Damo's Team Talk this time coming out of round three and I will say from the get-go there's some promising numbers here that I'm about to show you in a much better position compared to I guess this time last year um, so yeah it is very, very good, and I am very, very happy at the result. But uh, of course, before we jump into things, just want to jump across and remind the fellow folk, of course, those of you tuning in, uh, as I did last week, the uh, watch time from subscribers is fantastic, but the watch time from non-subscribers is a little bit perplexing uh, because here, as I spoke of last week, it was 70% and uh, 30% or thereabouts uh, in terms of the non-subscribers compared to the subscribers. But this time it's gone down to 64.2 compared to 35.8 of those of you who are absolute legends that have subscribed. So let's push that number down so it can be a little bit closer to 50-50 uh, if you haven't yet subscribed. Give us a subscribe and uh, we thank you all for doing so because it does show to us that uh, perhaps you're enjoying the content we're putting out there. So thanks in advance. And whilst we're at it, let's just jump across to our audio podcast. And for those of you who... May have tuned in, maybe on the road, uh, doing the washing, cleaning up, all that sort of stuff. If you can give us a uh, rating here, as you can see on the right hand side, uh, if um, you know you can see us now on YouTube, uh, and you're not tuning in via the audio podcast as it is. But if you are at the moment, give us a rating um, on your platform if you listen to us on Spotify, and if you are on the uh, the Apple Podcast side of things, you can also give us a rating, which at the moment, we're at 14 ratings. Again, just shows to us and uh, fellow people out there that may stumble across our content um, in the future, they can see that there's ratings there, that the people listening, and uh, they can sort of look at that and be like, yeah, okay, five stars. Let's give it a listen um, or give it a watch in the case of YouTube. So enough of that jibber jabber. Let's jump across to, as you can see here on screen, if you're watching us on YouTube, my takeaways and my results from round three. And as you can see here, I ended up scoring a 1,938, which uh, I thought was around about on par, but as it turned out, it was actually above par. Because as you can see here, my season rank was pretty much split in half uh, compared to last week, um, up in rank 4,797 to now sit ranked 4,881st overall, which at the moment is absolutely fantastic and shows that we're still in the running. Uh, at this stage of the game, uh, you need to sort of be within sort of arm's length of the pack at the top. So really, really good and happy enough that we are chipping away. And uh, here we go, flicking across the next screen. Ended up winning six out of my 12 league matchups. But uh, let's have a quick look at how our team fared. Actually, first, before we do that, let's just have a look at the history. Compare this time to this time last year. So, of course, we are... Uh, tracking quite well in round one, we were ranked 29,851, then into 9,678 last week, and this week, as I said, into 4,881st overall. Now, let's compare it to round three of last year, and I was ranked 36,899, so we have uh, risen up the ranks a fair bit already compared to last year in terms of um, climbing the ranks, but uh, just in terms of where we're sitting at the moment, absolutely fantastic. So we are well within reach, which is good to see. And um, hopefully we can keep tracking an upwards trend. Um, so let's get into our team and how we fared. So as you can see here, Tom Stewart, 99, just fell short of the ton. Uh, Nikki Dacos, a 112, bounced back a little bit better compared to the previous week, but I uh, had the VC on him. Um, and again, it's the Thursday curse. I spoke of it last week and uh, it may have struck again, but uh, yeah, it wasn't a VC lock-in score worthy of the captaincy. Uh, Harry Sheasel, 128, again, going from strength to strength. If you don't have this bloke, Get him in your team. He is going to be a top six defender this year. Uh, in terms of the, uh, sorry, I should go through the the trades that I did last week, um, which I will bring up on screen now via Twitter because I did listen down. Uh, and it was Hayden Young, uh, Tom Berry and Sexton to Wanganin Miller, uh, Tom Powell and Harry, uh, sorry, not Harry Sharp. It was uh, Jeremy Sharp from Frio. So kind of went through... Uh, in terms of a bit of a sideways trade, uh, correcting a um, 
a cash cow in Sexton to Sharp, who um, I foresaw as someone that's going to be uh, a must-have, and uh, he proved that on the weekend. And, um, of course, correcting Tom Berry, who made us around about 45K in a week, uh, which helped us actually get in um, Powell. And then also, uh, again, Hayden Young. I was kind of on the fence about getting rid of him, bit the bullet, and was just worried about him potentially losing that 40-odd K in a week. Uh, he bounced back, of course, uh, as Liam and I said that he would at some stage, but didn't think it would be as quick as what he did. So he punished me for trading him out. Um, and ended up moving him on to Wangan and Miller, who I think is going to be someone that's going to come out of the blocks and uh, be someone that could contend for the top six averaging defender uh, spot. So, of course, uh, a bit of a segue there. Wangan and Miller on debut for my team, a 91, which is pretty good considering that he had a very, very slow start to the game, and I was very, very worried about uh, that trade-in. But, of course, you can't really get hung up or assess, um, you know, on one week alone. So... Did well enough, uh, considering Dan I was 68, so thereabouts. Still made us some cash uh, to the tune of uh, 67.9K, so a very nice price rise um, first up for him, and he is projected to go up another 23.5K if he can score that projected score through Supercoach Plus of a 64. So tracking nicely there. Uh, and as you saw here, and as I went through uh, in last week's Team Talk video, was I was using Zach Reed, which is what I'm trying to do now um, until Reed comes back into the team uh, and returns to full fitness, of course. I'm going to be using him as a bit of a loophole between Howes and Williams. And uh, I did just that in the weekend, of course. Um, playing in the Good Friday game was Zach Williams. So I had the early game, put the emergency on him, and then assessed his score. And off the back of that score, depending on how he performed, uh, I could then stick with Reed on field, loop on Williams' score, or I could go for Howe's score. Um, so it ended up working out well because obviously there's a bit of a, what, 44-point differential there. So um, yeah, it, it, uh, it could have been entirely reversed. I mean, Williams could have scored a 26, and then I would have kept Williams on the bench um, and then put Howe's on field uh, if that was the case. So it's going to become something that's uh, a bit of a... Um, an extra weapon in my arsenal, I think, from week to week. And as you can see here on the right-hand side, if you're viewing this on YouTube, the fixture. Uh, of course, Essendon have the um, uh, what, the third game. Oh, they've got two Friday night games this week. Oh, sorry, Friday games. Interesting. Of course, this is the gather round coming up. Uh, and Carlton have the game on Saturday. So I will be doing the same thing if I can. Yes, because Melbourne play first up. So I'll be doing the reverse here and putting... Uh, the emergency on house, which we will do here, and then putting Williams on field. Uh, might as well make this change now, uh, otherwise I'll forget to do it at the end of the video. Um, but just to sh sort of show you this visual here, if you're watching us on YouTube, um, I've, and if you're listening to us on the audio podcast, I've virtually just put the emergency on house uh, in defense, and then I can assess how house performs in the first game against Adelaide. And if he scores well, um, I will put Zach Reed on field, of course, to loop on Howes' score. And if Howes goes shit, I'm going to be subbing Williams on field. So um, something that uh, is a bit of a bonus uh, off the back of, I guess, a bit of a silver lining um, off the back of Reed's injury and just the lack of, I guess, other um, defender rookies. Uh, let's move on to the midfield. And Bontempelli, 110. Uh, he was my captain and... Um, uh, wasn't too displeased, I think. I mean, it was within two points. I always kind of go by, as long as they're within arm's reach of the vice captain's score, it's not the end of the world. Um, if they score well below the vice captain's score, then I kind of am a little bit annoyed. Um, but I think at that score of Dacos with 112, I was never going to lock that in. So I was kind of expecting Montepelli to be played forward a bit more, rested, maybe rotated off the bench a bit more, which is kind of what happened. Um and yeah, he ended up scoring lower than expected, but uh, was better than what it was because late in the game, I think he was around about 75, 80 points or thereabouts. And then he kicked a couple of goals late and got scaled up a couple of points as well in the end from 108 to 110. So it wasn't the end of the world. Um, and yeah, we'll, uh, we'll stick with that because he was the high captaincy choice across the league. So... Uh, nothing lost, nothing gained really there. But uh, what we did lose was the potential for Max Gorn. He was someone that I was looking at potentially against uh, Soldo, who gave up a fair few points the previous week. And I thought that might happen again with Max Gorn, but didn't want to back it in uh, just because, again, it got swindled by Dacos. 
Um, and as I spoke of last week, the other option was going for Isaac Heaney as my captain and putting the VC on Lebont. So I probably should have gone down that route, but it is what it is. Uh, of course, Tom Green was the um, guy who was just peeling bananas on the bench, as uh, Abs Magic says, um, kicking his feet up and just watching uh, from the bleachers. Uh, but it did end up working out well because, again, I used him as my captaincy loop, oh, sorry, my, just my standard loophole, bench loophole, uh, with Jeremy Sharp. I put the emergency on him. Uh, he, of course, was my new recruit. Scored a 71, and I was happy enough with that, so I just left it as was. Otherwise, if Sharp scored shit, I would have put Clark on field instead of Tom Green um, and, and kind of gone down that route. But as it turned out, I ended up netting an extra three points by doing that. So, yeah, not, not too bad, but uh, just those are kind of the tactics that you need to use that are next level, which can give you a couple of extra points or potentially, uh, you know, quite a handful of points depending on what transpires. I took the risk on putting Carroll on field. I had to kind of take a risk with um, certain rookies, which is what I did with all these guys here in terms of Roberts, McKercher, Reed, Sanders. And I thought I'd do that as well with Carroll because he was playing North Melbourne. Easy matchup. I ended up scoring a 65. Was three points less, as it turned out, than um, uh, than Clark from the Cats. But um, yeah, it is what it is. Uh, losing three points, yeah. I think I kind of dropped out of the... Uh, my overall score anyway, because he was in my lowest uh, 22 scorers, of course, pegged down to the top 18, um, given it is top 18 for the early buy rounds. Um, going back through the rest of the score, so Nick Martin was a 136. I spoke of it last week. I was on the fences whether I was going to keep him. I did like the matchup with St. Kilda because, again, this is kind of next level um, strategy you need to be looking at. Um, and I, again, endorse people to do this. But just with the matchup with St. Kilda, they do give up quite a few points to opposition defenders and especially opposition wingmen slash sort of those rebounding defenders. So I was backing that in and I thought Martin might be able to, you know, roundabout reach his break even. And I think he actually eclipsed it by a few points and actually went up in price, believe it or not, um, to the tune of 4.5K. So was really happy with that. Um, quite a few people traded him out. His ownership went has actually gone down from 26.2% in round one down to 15.2%. And last week it was 20.3%. So a lot of people were jumping off. Um, and I'm happy that I've got him now as a bit more of a pod type option. Um, I'm not sure how he's going to fit into my team long term. Um, but I think come round six, he will get that defender midfielder status, which will come in handy, no doubt. Um, so I will be at least keeping him until then and hoping that he doesn't need 44 disposals every single week to um, score as well as he did on the weekend with 136. And again, it's something that Liam and I spoke about in the main podcast. I likened him a bit to Tom Mitchell uh, in terms of needing those you know, bulk disposals in order to score well. And that's kind of, I guess, coming to fruition a bit here. But um, it's, it's more so a lot of his ball is uncontested. So that's probably big part of the reason why, um, but we'll back him in and uh, we'll see how he goes. Next up, we have uh, Manny Roberts, 98, again, going from strength to strength. Uh, he made us a bulk buttload of cash here. Um, went up the previous week, 69K, ding, ding, ding. Uh, and this week went up 60.3K with a negative break even again of negative 28 with a projected rise of 46.8K. So he's going to be someone that I think we can hold even on to past uh, Sydney's early buy, just because he's becoming that much of a, I guess, a crucial cash cow that's going to make us among probably the most cash of all the cash cows that we've got. So hang on to him and um, he'll treat you well. Uh, speaking of which, Colby McKercher is another one as well to hold on to. Negative 16 break even, uh, went up 64.5k um, playing his third game and he's projected to go up another 39.8k with a negative 16 break even. Uh, these guys here are crucial as well because they can score quite well as playing cash cows. Uh, next up, we have Harley Reid, 54. Not the best, um, but I guess with this DPP that he does have, will come in handy across the early upgrade season, uh, which we're heading into. Uh, went up 34.9K with his first price rise with a break-even of 22 and a projected price rise of 15.7K. So um, I know some people might sort of look to trade him out, which... I guess of all the cash cows that we've kind of got, he's kind of the weakest link at the moment. But I think there will be spike games that he will deliver where he's given a bit more time in the midfield, especially. Um, he's kind of being managed still, I think. Um, he's not playing 92 minutes, 88, and then 92 over his first three games. So 
I reckon he will have a bit of a spike game, which could have happened uh, in round two against the Giants, but he was kind of managed. So uh, just keep that in mind. Riley Sanders, 77, again, going from strength to strength. Group him in with Roberts, McKercher as well, in terms of the strongest cash cows. Thank God he wasn't, uh, of course, um, subbed, but uh, to sub Libba, gee whiz, I don't know what Bebo was doing. He's, um, he's next level crazy. But anyway, as I said, uh, Jack Carroll, 65, super happy with him. Went up 60.9K and goes into next week with a negative 33 break-even and a projected rise of 35.3K as well. Um, if you haven't got him, look at him very, very closely. Um, Jeremy Sharp, as I said, 71, and he kind of uh, repaid the faith in me going for him and making that corrective trade of Sexton to Jeremy Sharp. Um, so yeah, 60.9K has gone up with a projected rise of 36.3K next week with a negative 28 break even. Uh, rounding us out here on the bench for the midfield is Jai Clark, negative 39. Uh, is his break even going to this week? Went up 32.1K with a 32.8K projected price rise for next week. Moving to the rucks, and we have uh, Maxi Gorn, and he was Maxwell Gorn. He was absolutely going gangbusters, 177. Uh, and I just, I don't understand people that didn't start with Max Gorn. Again, you probably want to go contrarian, but like Liam and I said across the preseason, don't fade this guy. He's got the pedigree. We know what he can deliver as a solo ruck, and he did just that in the weekend. 177, much like his spike game in round one against the Dogs with a 162. Um, and yeah, he's at 51% ownership. Went up 51.9K, which is probably around about what his starting price should have been. Um, I guess, you know, if he didn't have that uh, zero game factored into his average um, for, you know, from last year hitting into this year. So again, an absolute gun. Projected to go up 22.2K and should be in a lot more teams than what he is. Uh, Brody Grundy, 114. Uh, Kind of we're we're kind of getting what we what we expect I think from Brody Grundy. I don't quite understand why people are so harsh on him. People have traded him out over the previous three rounds, um, but yeah, he's going to have those games that I think are going to be spike games, and he faces West Coast this week, so it, this should be a spike game um, against uh, Poultry Ruck uh, competition, and um, yeah, he is someone that uh, you should be holding on to, and um, yeah. That's just my opinion. Uh, moving on to the forwards, we have Isaac Kenny again. Just incredible, this bloke. He's gone up another 45.7K to now sit priced at 591K overall. And his overall price rise has been 107.3K. So just underlines the, I guess, the, the value that we're getting from him. But these scores, absolutely insane. And he's the uh, number one ranked scorer for the season thus far. With scores of 144, 136, 128 and a 148 on the weekend against the Tigs, and now faces West Coast. So it could be an absolute mammoth game again uh, in the 140s, um, and it's projected to go up 38.7K with a break-even of 63. So his ownership has actually risen from 24.1 um, to 36.8 uh, so far. So he's showing that he's going to be a hands-down um, top six forward at the moment. Um, so yeah, he's someone that you should be targeting. I probably should have been targeting over the previous couple of weeks and is kind of getting away from it at the moment. Luke Jackson uh, went up 34.6K um, and he ended up scoring a 98. So not not as good as the previous uh, two weeks that he had, but still pretty good and a 19.6K um, projection price rise, I should say, uh, for this coming week, but did go up 34.6K on the weekend. Tom Powell, again, as I said, he was a trade-in option and I spoke enough about him as to why people should have targeted him last week. If you don't have him, get him in. Uh, he's still negative uh, break-even. Went up 62.8K, so fair bit of coin that you've, uh, you have to fork out now to get him in your team, but Liam said it best uh, during our uh, weekly podcast last week, and it was the fact that he could potentially be this year's Will Brody. Uh, we all remember the breakout year of Will Brody, um, and yeah, Tom Powell, have a look at him. He was an absolute gun in the under-18s uh, when he was drafted. This is his fourth year from memory, uh, and finally steps into the midfield, um, his usual role, um, and yeah, he's going to go from strength to strength. Probably should have been a higher score than 92, but I think his disposal efficiency let him down at around about 55% from memory, um, and yeah, he's projected to go up another 40.4K this coming week uh, with a negative six break-even that I spoke of. 
ran us out uh, the last three. James Jordan, 65. Not the best. Um, went up 24.6K with a total price rise now of 69.2K. Faces the Eagles this week. However, he does have a break even of 44, so it is creeping up there. And with a projected score of 70, he'll only go up 11.7K. Could have a spike game, of course, against West Coast, but also could only score around about 70, potentially. He's been... You know, I think this is the one week where he scored what he probably should have scored in the previous weeks, where he started slow and then come home like a freight train. Didn't do that against Richmond. um, And I think he's probably overstaying his welcome almost. Of course, after this week, Sydney go into a bye. Um, So if you want to get rid of him this week in order to sort of reach for a Flanders all alike, um, I think it is warranted. But we will get into that very, very shortly. Uh, Jack Billings, Bilbo Baggins. Now... I've named this episode after him. Bilbo, pack your baggins, mate, because you're out of the team. Um, super frustrating with Jack Billings. Uh, I, I don't know what it is. Like he, I know he only played 76 minutes, but you know to score a 119 and then a 69 the week after that and then a 42, it's just so frustrating. Of course, we trade him out. He's probably going to, in all likelihood, go gangbusters yet again and, and sort of re-energize his cash generation potential. But... I think, you know, he's got a break even now at 64. He's made us, um, what, uh, what's that, uh, 62K overall. Not the best, not the 100 mark that we're kind of looking for, but will enable most of us to reach the likes of a Flanders. Um, so, yeah, he's on the chopping block this week. Caleb Windsor, 56, kind of thereabouts, not too bad. Now gone up a total of 52.7K in price. On the weekend, went up 21.5K. So, yeah, he's projected to only go up 7.6K this coming weekend with a break-in of 37. He's been thereabouts. Uh, hasn't really had a spike score as yet, um, but is someone that you could potentially hold on to if you want to, uh, but also by the same token, considering Melbourne have the buy coming up in round six. Um, if you want to clear him out of your team, you can do it over you know the coming three weeks or thereabouts. And then, of course, Cadman didn't play, of course, uh, kicking his feet up, just uh, sipping a, a cocktail or two. Uh, and then Darcy Wilson, a 25, uh, the most disappointing of all the cash cows uh, thus far. Um, I don't know what the issue was there. I'll need to have a look at his game a little bit closer. But I think from what we saw in the preseason, um, he does have probably the, the most ability out of a lot of the cash cows um, to really have a spike game and really kickstart his cash generation yet again. Has gone up 34.4k in the weekend, has an 11 break even this coming week with a projected score, oh, sorry, price change of 14.4k. So that is pretty much our team. Let's quickly rejig it uh, to bring in and off the bench, our running man, Took Tookie Miller. Um, so we will be benching at this stage. We might bench Carol. Of course, you don't have the loophole options here to loop off the bench, apart from, as I said, Zach Reed in defense. So we're going to have to play rookie roulette by and large. That's a good sight to see Tuki Miller back on field. Alrighty, let's get into our trades ahead of round four. And uh, as I said, Bilbo, pack your baggins because he is out. Um, and even though he's only made us sub 70k or thereabouts, um, it is, as I said, um, going to enable us to bring in the one target that we've been looking to bring in at this time. It's always been the plan to bring in the man that is Nettie Flanders, that stupid, sexy one. Um, We were looking to start him at the start of the year, but of course, earmarked um, the buy that that just passed for the Giants and for Gold Coast is a bit of a danger week for us if we overlaid it on Giants and Suns players. And he was someone that... um, Unfortunately, I wasn't able to start, but I was able to start instead the likes of Isaac Heaney and Lukey Jackson. So, Semi Flanders, you're in, mate. And what we'll need to do is trade someone out of decent worth. And as I said, James Jordan is someone that you could probably uh, keep hold of for a week um, heading into their buy, considering uh, that the Swans play the Eagles. But what I will say is that I don't think there's much, I guess... um, likelihood of him being able to make any more bank than what he has thus far. And even if he does, it means you're going to have to hold him across his buy, uh, you know, uh, in two weeks' time. So this, for me, I think is a bit of a a no-brainer, and it will enable us to have a fair bit of cash left over um, at the back of this as well for another upgrade. So uh, what we'll be doing is going to the cash cow option, 
And we'll see here this man, Sam Darcy, which if I scroll down here, you'll be able to see he is in, uh, he's the most traded in play actually. So he's in currently 22.6% of trade plans at the moment. So yeah, he is someone that I think is a definite must have. So we'll bring him into our sides and complete that trade. It's going to leave us with 88.2K off the back of that trade. And you'll see here, what it has done is it's kind of enabled us to have a team that is fairly strong across the park. Before we make any adjustments on the bench, I'll just talk through the structure here and kind of what I was planning to do. And, it, it, you know, and just doing this, it really has allowed me to realize that we're actually ahead of schedule here, positively enough. So we've got four strong scorers in every single line. So we have Stuart, Dacos, Sheasel, and Wanganin Miller in defense. And then, of course, the uh, the two, I guess, rookies, relative rookies in D'Ambrosio and Williams um, on the bench, oh, sorry, on field in D5 and D6. Uh, and then for the midfield, we have Bont, Green, Miller, and Munn as sort of the four solid scorers. Probably a 3.5 because I'm yet to have the, um, I guess, the confidence to count Martin as someone that I can trust from week to week, but we will count him for now. Uh, and then, of course, we have Roberts, McKercher, Reed, and Sanders, plus all the rookies that we have on the bench, and Carroll, Sharp, and Clark as sort of those rotational rookies, uh, all making cash and um, being able to score solid enough. Probably out of those guys, the one that I'm a little bit, I guess, not as confident in is Reed at the moment. So um, it might be someone to switch with a Carroll or Sharp or a Clark. But uh, yeah, it's something that we'll need to assess based upon matchups probably more than anything. Um, so that's, again, something we need to look at. Um, and I do encourage a lot of people to look next level and look at matchups, uh, especially when trying to get the edge the super coach edge uh, with, uh, that was creepy. Uh, sorry, I just winked at the camera there for those people tuning into the audio podcast. Um, but uh, yeah, something that you need to be looking into, I think, um, when it comes to trying to get that edge with uh, predicting which rookies will score the best from week to week. Uh, in the rucks, of course, we've got Gorn and Grundy, fairly confident with those guys. Uh, and then in forwards, uh, we have Isaac Heaney, Jackson, Flanders, and Powell, all of who I am supremely confident in with their scoring potential. Uh, and then, of course, we're left with the two rookies with Windsor and Darcy, plus Cadman and Wilson. So those are kind of going to be... The, the rookie roulette, I think, is probably going to be the differentiating factor between um, us scoring super, super well and as, as well as we can um, compared to, you know, maybe potentially leaving some points on um, on the board. So... We'll see how things go from week to week, but that is virtually how we are placed at the moment. And like I said, with Heaney, I was kind of anticipating to you know trade him to Flanders uh, at this point in time, but I just didn't anticipate Heaney to be scoring as well as he is. Um, so he is a definite keeper. Luke Jackson as well is someone that is kind of... Uh, he's not overstated his welcome, but I think he's kind of... He's, he's played his played more games than, than what I thought he might without Darcy being back in the team. Um, and yeah, we'll just keep riding this high as long as we can. Um, Flanders is an outright gun and I spoke enough about Tom Powell as well. And I do think he's a genuine, as Liam said, um, Will Brody uh, option for 2024, just because he's not going to be losing those those um, CBAs. And uh, he's someone that is going to be an absolute gun from here on out. Uh, outside of this, I'm still kind of on the bench in terms of if I should use my boost. Now, I have used, of course, the boosts across the first two weeks, which is something that I identified I was going to do, hands down, just to correct those rookies that I had missed and uh, make any other corrections if need be. So we will go ahead and we'll activate this boost just for now. Uh, again, I'm not set on if I will use it, but I think there's two options I can go down here. And it's to do, the first avenue is to do with Howes. Um, He's got a break even of 30 this week. Melbourne play the Crows at Adelaide Oval. Um, Howes thus far, he scored the 91 in round zero, a 64 in round one, 68 in round two, and a 26 in round three just gone. So that really has stunted his cash, I guess, generation ability. Um, and he's only projected to make us another 13.1K potentially uh, on the weekend, but he could easily kickstart his cash generation and go as high as around about 280 odd, maybe even 290. So could be a little bit of a slower burn from here if he is, um, you know, just without May being there, I think is probably um, part of the reason as to why his cash generation has stunted uh, as well, just because he's, he's you know, asked to, to play a bit more accountable. 
and play on those bigger bodies that uh, that Stephen May may um, may may <laughs> may um, have been asked to to sort of play on instead. So. If I was to move on Howes, it would be, of course, for a uh, rookie in defense. Now, the problem is here, we're strapped for options here uh, for genuine uh, lower price cash cows. Charlie Dean is obviously out of the team for the pie, so he's not an option. Um, and the only other options that we do have, uh, as you can see at the top here, Tom Brown from Richmond, 154.2K, has come in as a bit of a Gibkiss replacement, so he should have the job security, negative 35 break even. Um, scored a 60, I think it was, on the weekend. Um, buttering up from a 63 in his first game the previous week. And um, if he sticks around that mark of 66 as a projected score, according to Supercoach Plus, could make us um, as much money as 150K. So he is someone that um, I would definitely consider. Likewise, Josh Draper from Frio. Negative 32 break even. He's at a lower price point as well, I should mention, uh, Josh Draper, 123.9 compared to Tom Brown's 154.2. So there's a fair bit of difference there. What's that, 31K? Um, Negative 32 break even for Draper. He scored a 68 and a 35 in his first two games. And uh, as you can see here, he's only projected to to make scores of 34, but this is according to Supercoach Plus, of course. And if he can only reach that mark, He'll only make us uh, 50k or thereabouts and be a very, very slow burn thereafter. But again, he is someone with a fair bit of job security. So don't mind him either. So it comes down to those two guys. I think the extra 31k um, will come in handy. That's a fair chunk of coin to outlay uh, to try and bring in Tom Brown over Josh Draper. Um, and you're only going to be netting, what's that, 61k off this trade of Howes to Brown compared to Howes to Draper which will net you, what's that, 82K or thereabouts. Um, actually, was it 82? 92K. Um, so, yeah, bit of a difference there. So it would be a Josh Draper. Um, only leaves me with 179.9K, I say only, jokingly, of course. Um, but that is a definitive um, option we could pursue. But also, what we could pursue is something that I think I'm... And it's, it's something that I'm thinking about because I missed this one guy. And I am, by and large, very, very happy with my team. I'm happy with the cash cows, except for one glaring omission. And it's someone that uh, I was keen on, as you would have heard last week in last week's Team Talk video. I was weighing up between Jeremy Sharp and Ollie Dempsey from the Cats. Ended up going for Sharp. Was totally fine with the decision, but just not having Ollie Dempsey in my team, who is someone that I think... As you can see here, um, is someone that uh, could make fair fair coin, um, considering that. Uh, well, again, comes down to his scoring, obviously, as well. But with an 86 in his uh, price cycle for the next two weeks, um, it could bode well. He's got a negative 19 break even heading into this weekend. Faces the Dogs and then faces North Melbourne, um, and has a projected price rise of around about 90k over the next two weeks. Of course, that is through Supercoach Plus projecting a score this weekend of 101, which is probably a little bit ambitious, but he has scored a 96 and an 86 um, in his first, well, two of his first three games. So could be on the mark, could be way off. Um, but if we extend out that projection uh, or his outlook, could make as much as 100K over the next three weeks. So again, is it a matter of potentially bypassing Draper for a week and you know foregoing potentially a bit of a price rise from Draper first up and then trying to bring Draper in next week off the back of Howes, maybe. And I mean, Draper will, if I just go back into Draper again, I do think Draper is gonna be more of a, he is traditionally more of a lockdown defender. So probably will only average around about 60 at best. So yeah, if he scores a, a 60 odd, could go up 45, 50K maybe. Um, but you know, it just means that we'd have to shave off that from what we will be, um, I guess, yeah, taking, I guess, from uh, a direct trade of Howes to, to Draper at the moment. But if we look at it in terms of what Howes could potentially go up in cash at, uh, which would be, just to sort of offset, um, could go up potentially 13.1K. So that might offset the, the 40 to 50 odd K 
that Draper may go up. So it may mean we only have to fork out an extra 30 to 40K um, to go house to Draper um, uh, the next coming week. Or I say fork out, but you know, not in terms of that. We'll be losing, I guess, in terms of the, the price um, difference and the money we'll be making in terms of that difference. So um, that is something I'm factoring in. I don't know which way I'm gonna go yet. I haven't spoken about who I would, would be trading to Dempsey. Um, but it would have to be someone that is around about that price, which when I'm factoring things in, it comes down to does the player that I'm trading out have an early buy? And does this player that I'm trading out have any sort of real upside of maybe having a spike game based upon the fixture that they have over the coming you know, short term? So that player would have to be, in my case, Caleb Windsor because he's priced around about that that same price point as Dempsey. Dempsey's priced at 219.8K. Windsor is 233K. So it would at least give me 14K difference. Doesn't mean I have to having to put some cash in in order to upgrade to get Dempsey in my team as I would have to do if I'm trading a Wilson to him because Wilson is, what, 40, 54K um, cheaper than Dempsey. So I don't want to be doing that. I don't want to be dipping into my bank in order to, I guess, rookie correct um, or jump on a rookie that has catapulted and looks as though they're going to be fast tracking our, I guess, price rise uh, across the board and uh, team value appreciation, I guess, if you want to look at it from that uh, that perspective. The other thing I'm looking at as well is potentially trading a Windsor down to a Harvey Thomas and bypassing Dempsey altogether um, because he does have a negative 52 break even, which is, of course, better than Dempsey's. He's already gone up 57.7K, has Harvey Thomas. He's in 11% of teams at the moment. And the one good thing is his most recent score, which was against West Coast, was 107. So that's going to be in his three-round price cycle for the next two weeks at least. Um, and will mean that if he scores 51 at the very least, according to Supercoach Plus, he will be going up, uh, what's that, 70, 84K or thereabouts over the next two weeks. So could potentially uh, make you know, probably just as much money as Dempsey. Dempsey does have the higher, I guess, ceiling when it comes to um, his scoring and uh, more reliable and looks as though he's going to be making a little bit more money. But I wouldn't be getting you know the extra coin as I would by trading Windsor down to Harvey Thomas as I would by going Windsor down to Dempsey. So those are, I guess, the three scenarios that I'm thinking about. Fourth, including if I just keep the um, the boost, as I spoke about last year as well, for those people regularly tuning in, what I learned anyway, comparing last year to the year prior, is it's pretty beneficial to go hard with the boosts early, just to sort of get a jump on making sure that you are correcting your team to the nth degree, where you have the best cash cows and the best primos. By and large, I like to back in my primos. It's the mid prices probably more than anything that you want to correct. And yeah, that's probably my thoughts on that. But uh, those are the four scenarios. And um, I'm probably leaning towards more so fading Draper for this week, aiming for Draper next week, um, trading house down to Draper then, and then maybe targeting a Harvey Thomas or an Ollie Dempsey this week. Again, we uh, will need to weigh some things up, but we'll leave things as is at the moment, uh, which will leave me with uh, 88.2K. We'll just um, undo that boost there. Yeah, 88.2K. So we do have a bit of room to move. Um, I'll actually, first and foremost, I'll go through my captaincy and VC options, which of course I'll do ever so briefly. Uh, tune into our weekly podcast, of course, where Liam and I will go into our top three options when it comes to VC and C options. Um, but what we're thinking at the moment and bear with me because this is the first time I've looked at the fixture for round four. Of course, reminder that this is a full best 22 round. No top 18 uh, because everyone is playing. Um, so, or best 18, I should say. So, um, first and foremost, Adelaide, Melbourne. There isn't really anyone that I've got. Um, oh, actually, sorry, there is a Maxi Gorn, which we'll just have a look quickly at his projection. It's 127. And as he scored 120, 100, and 124 against the Crows in his past three, he's an option. Um, who else is there in terms of the big dogs? Um, the Bulldogs played Geelong. How's Lebont gone against the Cats in recent times? He scored 146, 113, and 109. Um, so he's an option. Sydney against West Coast. I think Heaney is someone that I'd be keen to put the VC on at the very least. Um, he scored 150 in his last game against West Coast. 
um, last year, a 112 and an 80. So if we want to go down that route, which I'd be kind of keen to do, uh, let's have a quick squeeze. So Henny will put the VC on. Of course, this could change, but um, this is kind of my first thoughts. Who else is there? Of course, Tom Green um, against the coast uh, Gold Coasters, the Suns. I don't know if anyone's calling them the Gold Coasters. Um, but uh, Tom Green, of course, he's just through and through an absolute gun. Scored a 147 against them when he last played them, which was back in 2022. So he must have been injured last year when they were fixtured to play. Um, and then he scored a 92 uh, in the game prior. So he's only played the two games against the Suns. But I think that's probably the route I'd be going down at the moment, yeah, for my team. So um, that's pretty much that. And I think we will be, again, depending on if I trade out Windsor or not, I'll need to work out uh, for matchups. Uh, St. Kilda against Richmond, they're playing, aren't they? Yes. I'd probably be more keen to sub on Wilson, um, just because the Tigs, they're being given up a fair few points. Um... And I don't know if it go with Cadman over Windsor, or I might go... I actually might switch Reed into the forward line again, because we'll stick with him, because he is, by and large, the more uh, picked player on field, as opposed to starting bench, as you can see there. So that kind of negates the risk, in case he has a bit of a, um, a blinder of a game. And I think I'd probably play... So Freer play Carlton, Geelong play the Dogs. Yeah, this is hard. Uh, Adelaide Oval. I need to work the things out, but I might go Carroll on field, maybe. Yeah, I'll I have to work this out. But and that's pretty much it for this team. Uh, let's have a quick look. Also, I just want to remind people. This is something that I encourage people to do um, week on week. Is go through the players uh, and have a look. Just sort things by. Uh, if you just go by, you can go cash cows or you can go um, this consistency. But for me. What I normally try and do is break even. So I click on break even and sort it. So obviously you can sort it into negative break evens, which will show you the, the best, I guess, cash cows. Um, but I sort it by the highest break evens, go through and identify these guys that we see as primos that have high break evens that could be, I guess, in free fall, um, sort of falling in cash, as you can see here, Jordan Dawson, uh, Nikki Dacos, if you haven't got a Nikki. Um, Clary Oliver is another one. So what I do is I go through into their player profiles and I just add them to my watch list. And you'll see here, if I go back to my own watch list, that I've compiled quite a few players here. As you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, if you're watching us on YouTube, I've got Jordan Dawson, Oliver, um, and I've included Cash Cows as well to jump on. Josh Draper, Carl Warner, Sam Darcy, who I can take off now because he's in my team. Uh, I've got LDU, Tim English, uh, Rory Lair, Petrarca, Goulden, Sicily, Houston, Brayshaw, Merritt, uh, Luke Ryan, Sarong, Butters. So these are all guys as well that um, have gone up in price who I'm just keeping an eye on because if they have a bit of a down game or two down games in succession, they're going to fall in price. So these are kind of my targets that I'm looking to bring into my team over the coming weeks. Um, so yeah, the top of the list there is Jordan Dawson. He's going to drop another potentially, what, 30K they've put here, if you can score 103. Uh, and could drop as low as around about 530, 525 thereabouts, um, which for me will only be around about a 30K difference between Nick Martin and Jordan Dawson. Um, same can be said for Clary Oliver, which I probably won't jump on as yet, just because he looks a little bit unfit. Uh, wait for him to sort of hit his ceiling scores and then jump back on, um, or at least jump on him for the first time this year. Could drop as low as around about 520 odd. So could be a juicy prospect to bring in Maybe after his buy, if he starts hitting some form there. LDU, I was keen to start. Now I'm glad I didn't. Had a bit of a down game on the weekend uh, against my mob. Only scored a 67. So that's going to, again, stay in his price cycle for two more weeks. And um, even though he may score well over the next two weeks, his price should drop. So again, someone that I'd be targeting and so on and so forth. So I do encourage people. This is kind of my strategy, what I do um, in terms of targeting guys. So I don't forget, you know, who's kind of... Um, who, I, who I could be targeting um, and I don't have to do it week on week virtually going to the players and, and sort of noting down um, so it does help these guys will stay on your watch list um, for the entirety of the season and, and until you actually get rid of them so that's kind of what I'm thinking of doing at the moment uh, in terms of projecting and looking longer term. But anyway that's it ladies and gents let's uh, cut this video short here before we go on too long. 
Again, as always, if you have any questions, comments, let us know down below if you're watching us on YouTube. If you're listening to us on Spotify or on Apple uh, Podcasts, of course, you can slide into my DMs at DamoJ88. Or, of course, you can hit Liam and I up collectively at supercoach underscore edge. Uh, and likewise, uh, just a reminder, if you are listening to us on the Spotify side of things, Make sure to give us a rating. That'd be absolutely fantastic. And likewise, as well on Apple Podcasts, we do really appreciate it. And if you're listening to us on YouTube, or sorry, watching and listening to us on YouTube, uh, don't forget to give us a sub so we can push this um, percentage down from 64.2 non-subscribed and push up the subscribe number from 35.8%. That'll be absolutely fantastic. And we do thank you very, very much, Lee. Uh, but that's it, ladies and gents. Thanks again for tuning in. Again, hope you had a great result coming out of round three and we'll uh we'll see you in the weekly uh podcast vodcast depending on how you consume us coming up but until then we'll uh bid you farewell and all the best heading into round four but we'll see you in the main podcast we'll catch you then cheers